We meet together this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. I greet you good morning once again, and welcome to our service. I am Shannon, and my colleague Andrew will be preaching for us this morning. Friends, I know that there the world at this point in time is a little bit of a mess. And this morning, the Archbishops of Canterbury and York have put together prayers for peace and has asked that this Sunday be made a Sunday for peace. And so much of our uh, prayers and much of our readings will be towards that outlook, that we go and move in peace. And so we pause this morning just for a brief moment before we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We say together at the bottom of page one, Almighty God, to whom all the hearts of the world, all desires of men, and from whom no secrets are made, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all people. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our name in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, for our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. Son of Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is in us, and grant that we may serve you in unity to the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep in life eternal, through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
first colloquy from the inside of your cushion. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And at the front of the same issue sheet, we pray together this prayer for you. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit to come forth and draw near to them. We pray for those who cover over all peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children, at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. For our young people, Lord, we give you thanks for our young people of this church. Who they live and learn, and we pray that they have a great and special time together this morning. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Please sit for our readings. is 
serve the Lord our God and worship Him upon His holy name. For the Lord our God is holy.
My great grandmother, born Maria Zakrewski, was born there in 1893, in Ukraine's second biggest city, Kharkov, where there is fighting on the streets this morning. I remember her, though she died in London when I was very young. Her daughter, my granny, was born in St. Petersburg, but grew up in Estonia and came to London in 1934. My granny died in 2004. Twelve years before that, I set off with her to visit Ukraine and to see the house where my great grandmother had been born. We stayed in Kiev, Kiev to use the Ukrainian pronunciation, and travelled also to Lvov, now Lviv, on the Polish border, where my brother was completing some of his own studies. The events of this last week have been truly shocking. There has been a long-standing debate amongst Christians and other world faiths about whether war is ever justifiable. Much of that thinking comes under the heading of what's called just war theory. The first part of the theory relates to whether or not a war should be waged. Various criteria have to be met. The war must have a just cause, for example, against invasion or for self-defense, and not to acquire wealth or power. The war must be declared and controlled by a proper authority, such as a state or ruler. The war must be fought to promote good or avoid evil with the aim of restoring peace and justice after the war is over. Other parts of the theory relate to how war is waged. The war must be a last resort when all peaceful solutions have tried and failed, for example with negotiation. The war should be fought with proportionality with just enough force to achieve victory and only against legitimate targets. For example, civilians should be protected. The good which is achieved by the war must be greater than the evil which led to the war. Judged by these or any other humane and moral principles, the war now being waged in Ukraine by Russia is an immoral, evil war which should never have been started. The tragic elements of this war are too numerous to list, and one of them, thinking about us meeting together here in the church this morning, is that Vladimir Putin, the clear aggressor, self-identifies as a Christian. He was baptized into the Russian Orthodox Church as a boy, which wasn't all that common back in the Soviet era. His father, who worked for the NKVD, the predecessor of the KGB, was an atheist, but his mother was a devout Christian. Putin himself has said that he became a practicing Orthodox Christian in 1993, when he was 41 years old. He openly supports the Orthodox Church in Russia. There are thousands of photographs of him in church, kissing icons, lighting candles, greeting clergy. Jesus asks us, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And we should pray for Putin. And also remember that it's not what we call ourselves that is important, 
It's how we act and what's in our hearts. There's also some extraordinary Christian fantasy which is not unimportant as part of the background to all this. On the 12th of July 2021, Putin published a 7,000 word historical essay entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. In it, he says, Ukrainians and Russians are one people. For Putin, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are all descended from the first Russian state, Kievan Rus, founded in the 9th century by a Viking dynasty, the Rurikids. From its capital in Kiev, Kievan Rus extended its power from the Black Sea to the Baltic. It is seen by Putin as the font of Russian culture and religion, crucially converted to Orthodox Christianity in 988 by Vladimir the Great. Kievan Rus was later destroyed, but in the 15th century a new state based in Moscow emerged, claiming the mantle of its ancient predecessor and calling itself Russia. Both faith and history are important to every nation and to all of us. But it's so very easy to pick and choose with both construct elaborate fantasies around both, to think that your version of both is the only true version, and then in the worst case scenario to impose that on others by violent means. I'm very aware and feeling somewhat apologetic about the fact you didn't come here for a history lesson. Today we hold in our prayers the people of Ukraine and we read the story of the Transfiguration, Jesus' journey up Mount Table with Peter and James and John. On the mountain, Jesus is transfigured. His face and his clothes glow, and he is joined by Moses and Elijah. It's a beautiful and wonderful account. The interior light of Christ is shining out of him. The glory of God is being revealed. When we pray for Ukraine today, for its people, and the country's future, we are praying that the light of Christ will shine into all aspects of this terrible situation, into the hearts and minds of the leaders on both sides, into the grief already experienced by those who have lost loved ones, into the fear of those who are fleeing their homes. There will be and are practical things that we can do, but today, above all things, we can pray that the light of Christ may penetrate the darkness of this situation. The other thing about the Transfiguration which always reminds me of that, is that transfiguration involves the change of situations. Darkness, the absence of light, can never be a permanent state for Christian people. Transfiguration, transformation, change is always possible. Let us pray together 
for transfiguration for all those who are drawn to violence. And let us pray that the light of Christ, which shone out of him on Mount Tabor, may shine into our hearts and transfigure the darkness of all who are caught up in warfare this day. We pray for Christian leaders and those of all 
all faiths, who speak out for justice and truth. We pray for our archbishops of Canterbury and York, as well as our bishops of London and Stepney. And we give thanks for our own clergy here at St John's, Andrew, Sean, and Doug, and for the care they show us through their ministry. Help us to support them in their work. Lord, hear us. We give thanks for our parish and for the signs of hope as COVID rains drop and spring is in the air. We give thanks for our wonderful green spaces and the healing which they bring. May we all find joy in the easing of COVID restrictions and energy to invest in new projects. We pray for all those who struggle with illness, isolation and grief during these last few months. And we pray for the strength to reach out to them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those who struggle daily just to survive. We remember all who are suffering the results of conflict. And we remember especially people of Afghanistan and Yemen, who regularly face starvation. Help us to be generous in our response to charities which assist in these areas, and let us also remember those near home, who for whatever reason have no settled home or income. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, remember those who are unwell whether in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for strength and hope, both for them and their families, as well as their carers and the medical staff who work to help them recover. In a moment of quiet, we bring our own concerns to the Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We give thanks to the people who have been important to us and who are no longer with us. May they live in our hearts and give us strength. Lord, you promised to be with us always, even to the ends of the earth. We pray for those who are near to death, for their families and friends. May they find strength and comfort. We pray for those who weep. And we pray for those who are afraid of death at this time, thinking again, especially of Ukraine. We pray for the souls of the departed, remembering especially Father Ben Jones. Lord, hear us. Rejoicing in the fellowship of St. John the Baptist, St. David, and St. Andrew, patron saint of Russia and Ukraine, as well as Scotland, and of all those saints, merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. God is love, and those who live in love and peace live in love. Jesus says, My peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. So the peace of the Lord, dear friends, be always with you. Thank you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to set before you, which earth is given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to set before you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Please sit. I will be using Eucharistic for F on page 25 of your book that's if you wish to follow. The Lord is here. Spirit is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our Lord. Make us a perfect offering in your 
your sight. Look with favor on your people, and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sin, let the oppressed go free, and fill your church with power from on high. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with John the Baptist, St. Andrew, and St. Andrew. All your saints at the table in your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection, in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, Almighty God, forever and ever.
Liz has her hand up. Basil's birthday, yes, how can I forget?
the beginning and the end, as it's seven o'clock, you'll be very welcome. Um, I'll leave you to read about the church cleaning. Um, the Lent groups are starting on Tuesday, the 8th of March, um, but next Sunday, the 6th of March, we're going to be showing the film of the musical Hamilton in Crudo House, just over the road, which forms the basis of our Lent book, which will be written by Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin. So if you'd like to watch the film, that will be next Sunday, 4 o'clock at Crudo House, and then the course starts on the 8th of March. You don't have to have watched the film to join the course, so it's going to feel that you can't be on the course if you don't have time for the film. I'm going to leave you to read all the other notices and just to say that there's a new tea and coffee rotor which is on the table at the back of the church. Thank you. Amen. Hey.